Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight and taking time out of your evening to be here. So we are now hosting the third in a four part series of webinars um, on progressing your career as a SAS anaesthetist. Um, and tonight we'll be focusing on the specialist grade role. And the webinar has been organized in support of SAS week 2023 and in celebration of all things SAS. And in keeping with today's theme of the specialist role, our speakers will be covering topics on progression to becoming a specialist anaesthetist. And it will provide insights into the history of the role, the eligibility requirements of the new senior SAS contract, and how you might demonstrate that you meet them in order to progress. I'd also like to take this opportunity to share with you the launch of our new SAS handbook this week. So please do go onto the association website and make use of its contents. We have a free PDF download and we have included chapters on personal development, planning, well-being, leadership, financial matters and specific support for international medical graduates. So it really is a great resource for all SAS doctors. So I'm just going to mention a few housekeeping things before we start. This webinar is being recorded and you should all receive a link to the recording tomorrow. Uh, we've got over 80 delegates signed up for tonight's webinar, so microphones will be switched off. Um, but you please submit questions for each speaker via the question option on your control panel and on the right hand side of the screen. <clears throat> you can use the orange arrow on the top right of your control panel to reduce the size of the control panel. And the speakers will be displaying this screen, so if you click off and can no longer see the webinar, uh, please click on the blue or orange flower icon, which should be on your taskbar um, to rejoin the webinar. And um, please be aware that this is an educational meeting. And if you are reporting it outside, can you please do so responsibly, accurately and provide some context to any statements that you use? So a couple of our talks tonight are recorded. So if for any reason you cannot hear them when they're playing, please go to the handout section of the control panel and you'll find a Vimeo link here, which you can use to access the talk. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker of the night, Mr. Amit Kocher. Um, he is a associate specialist in ENT surgery at Morecambe Bay University Hospital and is the former chair and lead negotiator at the BMA SAS committee. So he is talking to us tonight about negotiating a new contract and the history of the specialist role. His talk will feature insights into the history of how the specialist contract came to exist and anecdotes relating to negotiating a new senior SAS role after the closure of the associate specialist role in 2008. So over to you, Amit. Thank you. Thank you, Nilofa, and, and a big, big, big thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I have various roles. One of them is um, my role with the BMA, in which uh, I was involved in negotiating the new contract. And when Rob asked me to speak about how we got there, I thought I'd share my journey. The journey was a journey of over 15 months. So, um, to encapsulate that, that in 15 slides is, is uh, tricky. I have to say I am an ENT surgeon for my sins, but I would have loved to be an anaesthetist, and especially since I've read this lovely handout that you produced, uh, which has been released today, I would recommend everybody reads it. Very, very good. So without further ado, let me start by saying that when we negotiated the new contract, we had a, a lot of challenges looking back. First one was, of course, pandemic. Um, and the fact that you can't see people that you negotiate with, you lose the body language and you're negotiating virtually is, is a big drawback sometimes. However, we have had our challenges and we were given a a cost envelope by government, and we didn't want to lose that envelope. Remember, we negotiated when the interest rate 
was um, sorry inflation was less than two percent so when when they told us three percent per year for three years we thought it was a brilliant option and we got more than the juniors did because they had two percent per year for three years the other challenges of course was this perpetual reform of the nhs the replacement of various structures by the new icos icss the changing demography of medicine with at some point almost 70 percent of medical students being women and a lot of people wanting to work less than full time with a different view of career choices and lastly the political pressures with delivery targets and a looming election rob and me both love this slide the gmc have stopped sharing this slide so the last time you will see this slide and this was generated on the 3rd of october 22 and i'd just like you to note that the total number of doctors registered to the gmc at that point was just over 350,000, and we were 105,000. admittedly being grouped as ses and led but it was still very useful because you could see this growth that was never ever documented before more than 40 percent growth since 2017 uh, amongst SES grades. The reason I show you these slides is because the aspiration was changing all the time that we were negotiating. So the grade first started as a medical assistant in 64 and became the associate specialist in 81 with the staff grade being introduced in 88. I just want to dwell on the title here. The story I have is that there were three consultants in the room and a doctor was announced by the sister. She came in and said, there's a doctor who's arrived. And they said, is he a junior doctor? She said, no, is he a consultant? She said, no. Oh, well, in that case, he's a member of staff. So let's call him a staff grade. Now to you, it became a national title and everybody adopted it as the existing title but there was that bit that i find still derogatory about it um so so when the first formal ss contract came for the associate specialist and of course uh, the, the subsequent staff grade contract um it was looked upon with sort of mixed feelings but then came 2008 which was the turning point in my view for SES careers, because the closure of the associate specialist grade took away from us such a huge, huge, huge thing. I wasn't involved in that at all. But then came the SES contract in 2021. I became chair subsequently of the BMA SES committee, and every survey we did, and there were three of them, asked us to bring back the AS grade. Suddenly, local trusts started appointing trust associate specialists, and although the BMA doesn't like to support non-standard titles, we had no option because that was the only career progression doctors were having. So in 2018-19, uh, I approached the Secretary of State for Health and I have to thank the Chair of Council then, John Nathpol, for having given me the opportunity to do so. It was the Chair of CC, the Chair of JDC, and the Chair of SASC, and I got stopped at the door, and he asked me, at the door, what do you want? And my response was, reopen the associate specialist, implement the SES charter, and give us the SES development funding. He then invited me in, sat down 20 minutes later, and the Secretary of State the next day, amazingly, sent a note to say, we will reopen the associate specialist grade. NHS employers had other ideas, uh, and rightfully so, in, in hindsight, it was better to, to negotiate the whole contract because we could we could provide a, a, a lot of things for specialty doctors as well in the process. So the title came, and you know, after a big fight, um, initially we were called the senior SES grade, then the senior specialty doctor, which meant that everybody else was a junior specialty doctor, which is not something we agreed. The last meeting was, I think, on the 10th of December, and uh, they said well it's senior specialty doctor at which stage we were ready to walk out they accepted the, the title specialist which does us and and going back to my my story of titles the staff grade is gone 
There's not less than 200 staff grades in the country today, uh, and the new specialist has been created. Sadly, we had to go with where the employer had a need, and that was because their uh, status was that even for consultant jobs, we have to have a need, we have to have a business case, we have to advertise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we asked for the option of choice. Okay, let me bring in this concept of autonomous work. And this is something we fought for very, very hard because we were fed up of seeing these multitude of autonomous working policies that were sprouting up in every corner, in every trust, and everybody asking to, to, to share, what did you do about autonomous working to get the associate specialist the recognition? I have to admit that at one point I asked my trust um, as to how many operations I had done last year. And, and listen, I'm an ENT surgeon. I operate every alternate Thursday and all day Fridays. Um, and they gave me a total number of six, six operations. And, and my Thursday lists are autonomous. Um, and sometimes the Fridays as well. And so out of those six, one was a hip replacement. So is isn't satisfactory, really. So we built in the autonomous work into the specialist paid. And although employers were keen that this be a service delivery post, we managed to get in uh, training, teaching, supervising other members of staff. The initial associate specialist was uh, after 10 years, and we introduced the concept of 12. Why did we do that? Well, the thinking that went in was the specialty doctor would now be four steps of three years each before they get to the top of the grade. So they'd be 12 as well. And what we wanted was that as many specialists that we could get would come from the specialty doctor grade with six years experience in a relevant specialty. And you can see we've automatically ruled out a lot of people. Then we had the specialist generic competency framework, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Um, we wanted to ensure that specialty doctors wouldn't work as specialists and not be offered the specialist post. And hence, uh, we've done two things. One is that there is cross the guidelines of the difference between the two, and you can access the links to get there. Um, at the end of this presentation. But the other, other thing was that uh, we introduced the concept of an acting of allowance, if that was the case where uh, a specialty doctor worked at the level of the specialist. We were trying to roll in a 19-year pay scale into, into a, a six-year pay scale. And you can imagine uh, that was never going to be easy. They insisted that the top of the pay scale be set at a level uh, of year four, five consultant. And by doing that, we were able to put some money into the specialty doctor contract so that we could take the top of the specialty doctor to 80,000. And as a result, we got the specialist to start at 81,500. The logic being, for the first six months, we had batted for a single spine and they had refused us all the time, they still do. So if we left a small gap between the two, the logic was that employers would say, hang on, we'd rather retain this doctor and for uh, 1500 pounds, we'd let them become specialists because they would be at the end of 12, 15 years providing that kind of service. Of course, the new contract has been done badly too by the government by not giving us the uplifts. Uh, this data was still from till May, and you can see that 914 specialists had been appointed. This is now 987, um, and most of them came from the specialty doctor grade. But you know what was the exciting thing is that there were specialty doctors moving to the 2021 contract and getting into the specialist grade. Another large number came from associate specialists. The largest number that we never thought would happen came from no record in previous months. So trusts were actually appointing specialists where they didn't have a job in the NHS before that. And that was interesting. 
105 consultants moved, and I suspect these are locum consultants who then consolidated their position and got a standard NHS job um, with the perks of being a, a national role rather than having a, a locally employed contract. The specialist framework, the gen generic competency framework, we built it with the colleges, um, and I'll talk about the colleges in a second, but the idea was to be able to kite mark um, our autonomous work and our recognition. Uh, and, and if you do ever look at the GCF, you will see how you can easily match what we wanted to achieve. Like the consultants, we, in, we were told that you had to work with the Royal Colleges. Now, personally, I, I'm not a big fan of the Royal Colleges, only because before 2008, they didn't even know we existed. It's only when the funding came, when the tutors came, et cetera, et cetera, the colleges got into the act. And now we have committees in every college, thankfully. We engage with colleges, um, all except the Royal College of Psychiatry, and I can, I can pick that up at, at another stage. Um, and, and this has made the specialists a better uh, type mark course with autonomous work. In our survey, uh, almost 30, this is November 22, 33% of the doctors said they wanted to become a specialist. And sadly, we've not been able to match these numbers. So when we talk about industrial action and when we talk to the Secretary of State, this is our first ask, give us more specialists. Every survey we've done, between 20 and 25% of SES doctors have said they want to be consultants via the Caesar route. But you know what? We've got to back for the other 75%. That is very, very important. And what will make the grade attractive was the remuneration to match my level of responsibility and seniority. 50% of them said that. 44% wanted to, to be specialists. And that's the famous excuse we get. There isn't enough money. But is that also an opportunity? I've given you the reasoning why we left the difference between the two so small. And um, perhaps we can do better. We're trying to produce a business case. We've actually produced it, um, getting a, a bit of a difficulty getting it recognized, but we will in the future. We think the 2021 TCS will help doctors to degrade uh, because this is promoting a progressive employment culture, encouraging recruitment, rewarding professional development, and ensuring that you have a local policy. Those are my links, and I will happily serve, circulate my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit. Um, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I don't think I quite appreciated how much um, blood, sweat and tears has gone into uh, the development of the role and the journey that specialty doctors and SAS doctors have had over the years. Um, thank you. So for anybody who'd like to ask Amit some questions, please use the question um, section on the control panel. Um, we will move on to our second talk for tonight. Um, this is by Dr. Kirsten May, who is an Associate Specialist Anaesthetist at Oxford University Hospitals and is the current SAS committee member at the Association of Anaesthetists. Um, she is the former elected council member and SAS committee chair at the Royal College of Anaesthetists and the former chair of SAS committee at the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. So Kirsten will be talking to us today about what does autonomy mean anyway? So within her wealth of knowledge and experience, um, she will talk to us about the current levels of supervision, including the national standards which defines adequate supervision. And she's also looking to what asking for help as an autonomous doctor actually means. So over to you, Kirsten. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Kirsten May. I have been a SAS anaesthetist since 2003, and I am currently a member of the Association SAS Committee. I'm speaking to you about autonomy and supervision for SAS doctors. 
What do we mean by autonomy? Autonomy is the ability to make largely independent decisions, using information, making choices, and taking responsibility for those choices. From the perspective of the employer, it means giving you a high level of discretion to make those decisions. What does this look like in practice? As an autonomously practicing doctor, you should make prompt assessments and appropriate diagnoses. You should be able to instigate investigations and make and carry out an appropriate treatment plan. You should be able to communicate those in full to patients, their carers and colleagues, including in writing. If necessary, you should be able to explain your plan and actions. In short, you should be able to take full responsibility for the whole patient journey, in most cases, including where caseload is complex. Whilst carrying out this work, you should also be able to lead others and teach where relevant. In short, and to quote the Royal College of Physicians, an expert decision maker who can take overall responsibilities for the patient. However, no man is an island. Autonomy does not mean we cannot ask for help. We are expected, indeed obliged, to work within our competence by the GMC. We should never be afraid or too proud to ask for assistance or a second opinion. Our working environments should not only facilitate this, but also encourage a culture of mutual support. There is a temptation to equate being a single-handed anaesthetist in your own operating theatre with true autonomy. Being physically on your own does not necessarily mean you take full responsibility for the whole caseload. Maybe someone is keeping an eye, indirectly supervising you. Maybe you need reassurance when planning a list or a helping hand here and there. Maybe someone else made the preoperative plan. All of this is fine, but it's not truly autonomous practice. Autonomy doesn't mean you have to be omnipotent. Doesn't mean you can't ask for help. It doesn't mean you can do everything. Commonly, the scope of practice of SAS doctors is quite narrow. You can be autonomous in part of your practice, but not in all parts. For example, you could be autonomous in providing anesthesia for adults and children down to a certain age, but not below that age. Our consultant colleagues often feel the same once they are a few years out of training. A common example for this is paediatric anesthesia. You must be able and willing to work collaboratively with colleagues where appropriate. Again, this is also expected by the GMC. Levels of supervision are outlined for trainees in the new curriculum. You may well be familiar with this in your role as an assessor for trainees yourself. In the parlance of the new curriculum, you must reach supervision level four plus. There are recognized standards of supervision for our specialty. You will find details in the Royal College guidelines for the provision of anesthesia services, often referred to as GPAS. This says in simple terms that trainees and non-autonomous SAS doctors should be supervised, should know by whom they are supervised, should be able to contact their supervisor and get assistance. If agreed in advance, autonomous practice for SAS doctors is possible, but needs to be formally agreed. These principles have led to the development of the so-called Cappuccini test, 
named after a tragic case with fatal outcome with which to test these arrangements. The Cappuccini test simply asks five questions. To start with, we ask the trainee or non-autonomous SAS anaesthetist, who is supervising you? How do you get hold of them? We then use the answer to question two to make contact with the supervisor. Did this result in successful contact? Finally, we ask the supervisor, who are you supervising? In a bigger hospital, this might include asking whether they know anything about the colleague they are supervising and their capabilities. What are they doing? Would you be able to attend to provide assistance? Having heard all this, you may now believe that you are already an autonomously practicing anaesthetist. So how can you show this? Here are some suggestions to show a mix of knowledge, training, skills and track record. Track record, keep a logbook. Include if and when you are supervised. Include when and whom you are teaching. How often do you ask for advice or help? Bear in mind, seeking assistance is not a sign of weakness, but also a marker of a mature professional. How often do others ask you for help and who asks you for help? Case-based discussions around complex cases can also support your case. Knowledge and skills. Do you have any exams or other formal qualifications to underpin your knowledge? Are you in a clinical or educational supervisor role? Are you trusted with delivering formal teaching on behalf of your department? You can also use the lifelong learning platform to have formal assessments carried out. Non-clinical activities can add to the picture of a rounded, mature and senior professional. Do you answer your own complaints or incident reports if relevant? What is the quality of your patient admin and letter writing? Compliments from patients and colleagues can help. Being the chosen anaesthetist when colleagues are patients says more than a thousand words. Local governance arrangements have been mentioned as required to have autonomy formally recognised. You should in the first instance discuss this with your line manager. Some trusts have local policies for this that may suggest what evidence is considered desirable. You should make a formal application. If successful, the arrangement should be formalized and included in your job plan. If not, it should be discussed how you can be developed towards autonomy and this should be part of your personal development plan and appraisal. What are the benefits of having autonomy recognized? Some are soft, like the satisfied smile. You may feel more respected in your department. You can also have operating lists, clinics, letters and coding done in your name. But importantly, SAS contracts require you to show autonomy to access the higher parts of the pay scale. Autonomy is also a prerequisite for appointment to a specialist post. To finish, I would like to quote Amit here. Working autonomously is a privilege that is often hard won through determination, hard work and demonstration of competencies. Many thanks for listening and good luck. Thank you very much for that, Kirsten. Um, again, a very interesting talk. Um, I think many of my fellow specialty doctors will um, really relate to that because it's it's quite a struggle in the workplace that you may feel and know that you are working autonomously, but actually, how do you go about um, showcasing that and taking it that step further and approaching your directors and managers? Um, 
So some great ideas there, thank you. So moving on to our third speaker for tonight, we have got Dr. Chris Moat, who will be talking to us about the specialist role from a clinical director's perspective. So Chris is a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care medicine at Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital, where he has been the clinical director for the past three years. Thank you, Chris. Chris, I think you're on mute. Is that better? Perfect. Can you Thank hear you. me now? I'm sorry about that. It wasn't, it was, I was green on the screen. I do apologize. That's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? Um, I think the best description of me um, was given by the consultant radiologist who reported um, an MRI scan of my brain uh, where he said, uh, brain unremarkable. And I think um, I probably just proved that. Uh, so uh, I've been a clinical director for three years, uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. So um, it feels like we're kind of at the, whilst the, the, the SAS contract has been um, in place since 2021 and, there's, and the negotiations were long forced and hard won um, for some time before that, um, it feels like we're kind of on the start of a journey and uh, like all um, journeys um, uh, they feature in hero stories you know we have a an arc we have a, a hero on a quest um, and that's the way our brains are programmed we like to know um, uh, if we're starting a journey where we're going to end up we like to know where the hazards are along the way where the places to rest are but that's not real life. Um, there are many sliding doors moments for people, um, and you might recognise a few here. Um, what would happen? What would have happened if Frank Lampard's goal was recognised for being over the line when it was? Um, uh, what would have What would have happened uh, if the Russian linesman hadn't um, inaccurately given England's third goal? And uh, the less said about Diego Maradona, uh, the better. But for all of us, um, uh, there are pivots and uh, things that happen in our lives and our careers that are unavoidable, unchangeable, and um, uh, that's just life. So we have to kind of uh, be aware as we journey through our careers that things might happen um, along the way. And I think the introduction of um, specialty and specialist doctor roles um, is a hugely positive step, um, not just for individuals, but also for uh, careers and for um, for clinical directors like me. Um, it opens the toolbox. It allows us to recognise and, and value people's skills, um, and uh, perhaps creates some uh, opportunity for conversations. Um, the term middle grade is now. Um, out of our uh, lexicon, or should be, um, and there's less barriers, I hope, to um, people developing fruitful, productive working lives. Um, for all of us, uh, um, as doctors, you know, you may well have been the smartest kid in your class, or the um, the first in your family to go to university or um, a, a high achiever, type A personalities. Um, and as I've grown older, um, I've had to challenge myself and ask, what does success look like? And then what does it really look like? What really makes you happy in your job? What is it really about your um, uh, work-life balance that, that you value? Um, and uh, being able to have those honest conversations uh, with yourself um, about what you want, what you really want, um, is um, incredibly important. Um, so the journey for a specialist doctor, um, there's a million different paths um, you can take, um, a million different ways you can uh, 
um, end your journey or um, and change as you as you go through your career. You can start out with an, an interest in obstetric anaesthesia and, and pivot and develop more of an interest in education. And there are a million and one options um, open to to all of um, our SAS doctor colleagues. And um, the tools are really are all there in our job planning um, toolbox for specialist doctors. Um, and as I say, I think we now are at a place where conversations about what you want and how you want your career to develop is um, uh, much more open. Um, we no longer have a um, middle grades confined to on-call rotors for the rest of their working lives. I think there are there are there are much better ways to represent to to recognise people's experience and and expertise. Um, and the SAS contract reform has really opened up all of those questions. So the one sure way to kill improvement in a department is short termism. Um, and seeing people as bums on seats um, does not make for a happy um, working department. People need to uh, understand where they are and have the ability to, to contribute um, and progress in their career um, in whichever way they see fit. There is a service need, there's always a service need, but you stifle um, service provision if you don't allow people to develop. If people feel like they're stagnating and not moving forward, um, then you become uh, disenfranchised. And I think that's very, very common in a lot of places where I've worked. Start that conversation now. Have a think about what you want to develop and take control of your own uh, uh, development. Um, SAS doctors, as with all of us, um, it's a box of licorice all sorts. So your development is very much an individual thing. For some people, um, and some of our SAS doctors who've transitioned onto the specialist contract, they very much want to retain their uh, working patterns with um, on call, um, especially our obstetric group of um, SAS doctors. Um, they very much want to retain that autonomy um, and the control they have over their working lives doing that. For some others, um, they want to work towards CESA and um, eventually, hopefully, become part of the consultant team. For some others, they want to explore other areas. We've got one SAS doctor who now has some PAs in the mortality um, review department of the hospital and who's broadening the sort of portfolio of her career um, by doing that. So there's no one size fits all. Um, pattern. Uh, everybody has the opportunity to um, explore and develop and I think the SAS contract reform really does open up um, uh, the conversations for that. Explicitly we need to recognise people's contribution and um, their expertise. Um, the world really is your oyster. Specialist doctors are incredibly valuable to the NHS. Um, there's no single solution. Um, we need to recognise the expertise that this group of um, under-recognised doctors have um, have brought to the NHS for so long. I I'm dreading the results of the, the BMA ballot because I think it will be very clear to everybody how important SAS doctors um, are to us if they choose to go out on strike. And uh, they really have kept things afloat over the last few months. Um, international medical uh, graduates on locally employed doctor contracts is a thing that I'm really troubled by. Um, now, we, we still have some doctors on locally employed contracts in our trust. Uh, I, I don't think this is OK ever now that we've got um, a, a defined uh, SAS contract. Um, 
locally employed doctors aren't protected by those contractual um, rights and I think are a hidden group of doctors and um, we talk a lot about the lost tribe when we talked about trainees um, who weren't able to progress into specialist training. I think um, international medical graduates on LED contracts are the biggest lost tribe at the moment. Um, so I'm never appointing an international medical graduate on a locally employed doctor contract. Um, they're all going on to SAS or specialist doctor contracts as appropriate. So I think you do need to start by asking yourself what you want and then asking yourself what do you really want and then in the words of Mel B, what do you really, really want? Um, I don't know is a reasonable answer to that question. Um, some very good advice I had as a um, uh, uh, registrar was to write my consultant, the, the CV for my consultant job application and um, with a sort of fantasy consultant um, CV and then fill in the gaps as the best I could of describe your arc, describe how you're going to achieve those things. Um, any reasonable CD is going to want to help you achieve those aims. It's okay to not know the answer to that um, and to start building towards uh, how you want things to be. Really do ask yourself um, those questions. Is being a consultant with a Caesar what you really want? Uh, why do you want it? Is it prestige? Is it something you genuinely want? Something that is a burning desire within you? And um, you know, it's it's there are so many options open to um, specialist doctors um, uh, building really interesting portfolio careers around the country, um, contributing to national um, groups and discussions. You know, from my work on the association, you know, the, the input and impact from from um, uh, SAS doctors is massive and that's happening everywhere. Um, listening to Mr. Coach's talk there uh, about his work with the BMA, you know, fascinating, really, really impressive stuff um, to have alongside your, your clinical career. And those doors are open for everybody. So the the ways to change your the change things and the ways to um, uh, get your CD to listen to you and the ways that I use as a clinical director to um, sit down with my uh, SAS doctors and work out what we're going to do for them. Um, the job planning process, appraisal, um, and training diaries uh, are incredibly helpful. Uh, processes um, to highlight and shine a, a spotlight on, on what you do and your scope of expertise. Diarise everything. Data really is your friend. There, there's never been a job planning dispute um, that hasn't been resolved in the favour of somebody who kept a contemporaneous record of their uh, job plan. So start that tomorrow if you don't already. Um, listening to some talks from uh, uh, SAS doctors um, at previous conferences, it's striking the uh, SPA DCC split that people have. Um, most often, I think uh, uh, SAS doctors had had one SPA in their contract. Very service heavy jobs. Now that may be the case, and that may well suit some people. Some people prefer to turn up to work, um, get get the clinical stuff done, enjoy the uh, you know training junior doctors, um, and then uh, that's it. They don't want to be involved in the the, the management, the sort of back end of a department. Um, but that may not necessarily be the case. So. Uh, Diarise and record everything. Um, the, as an example, the specialist doctor we have um, working towards Caesar, he has a day a week purely for Caesar paperwork, and he has two and a half SPAs 
and because he contributes to teaching audit governance work um, alongside um, his uh, DCC uh, stuff. So um, if you're doing it, make sure that it's recognised. And uh, that's something we've had to address with a number of our specialist doctors who were being um, underpaid for their uh, for the contribution they're, they're making. Um, and I think it's absolutely important that people feel that their, their time is being recognised. These aren't transactional discussions. These aren't all about money. Uh, this is about recognising the contribution people make to your department. And it's absolutely crucial that we do that in a fair and transparent way for everybody. You're going to face some barriers, but that's the way we've always done things. Um, you might be seen as bullshit or difficult because changing um, ingrained systems is sometimes hard. But the answer to the question, what can you do as a specialist doctor, is anything. Um, the the market really is open and you're hugely valued for what you do so how do you challenge the status quo and um, ask the right questions um, which questions do you really want answers to prioritize your ideas gather allies what does your lnc sas rep have to say do you have an lnc sas rep um why not you what are you going to ask? Be precise, have laser focused precision and persevere. If you're in the right place, it's going to happen and it will happen. So just to finish and summarise, what do you want? Ask those questions. Have you considered a coach or a mentor? Um, there's plenty around. The, uh, the association have mentors which will um, happily assist and, and help you. And lastly, I'm just going to talk about very briefly the importance of belonging. You know, you belong in a department. You need to feel that you belong in a department. It's absolutely important that um, you are made to feel valued and welcome um, in your place of work. Um, the Maoris have a, a thing called Farka Papa, um, uh, which you are related to your line of unbroken ancestors. Uh, leaders are literally group weavers. Um, people who bring other people together as a group and I think that's really important if you don't belong somewhere if you're not able to um, embed yourself in a department where you feel valued um, this is when unhappiness happens and you become um, dissociated and and uh, and trapped um, social engagement is better for everybody we feel connected Things are safer. People make better choices in departments where they're valued. Um, it's much better for you to work somewhere where you're valued. And, and uh, you know, the world, as I say, the world is your oyster and, and do choose a department where you, you feel valued. Um, the South African cricket team um, weren't particularly successful. They got together and they sat down and uh, broke, broke down some barriers. And the most striking um, barriers uh, were related to um, the apartheid system. And uh, you had uh, players of, um, uh, of color and uh, white players who had grown up very differently. Um, in fact, you had one member of the team who was outside a game um, uh, arrested and put in jail for protesting um, at a South Africa match that another one of the, the group were, was playing in at the same time. And the, the, the players of colour talked about their shame and um, uh, uh, at, um, uh, and how difficult it was for them to integrate in the team. And uh, it really broke down those barriers. Um, being open to uh, um, challenge and being open to uh, uh, differences um, in a department is absolutely essential. People must be able to um, explain why they feel less valued than others. They must be able to um, uh, explain uh, what's important to them um, in their working lives. 
and, and for everybody to share in that story and that sense of belonging because it's um, absolutely crucial um, for your department that everybody is able to knit together and work together um, and uh, the most important part of that for me is that you you know you feel that you belong somewhere so clinical director's job is difficult so be kind um, it can be quite a lonely place and um, I have no training or preparation for the role and I hope I've got better at it um, but it's difficult um, uh, some people have a sort of holding the baton approach they're just sort of keeping things tidy some people really like to lead the charge and make big change and most of us are, are somewhere in the middle um, so be kind to your clinical directors but be direct and uh, approach them if there's something you're unhappy with um, I'll leave you with a, a couple of quotes um, because uh, uh, that's the cheesy way everyone likes to end a, a talk um, we are who we are because of everybody else um, a department is only as strong as the, the people within it and it's important that everybody um, that you know the middle grades who come in and out of, of night shifts um, of old um, uh, uh, are no longer uh, I hope and it's important that everybody feels valued um, in the department um, we're all part of the same team we're all pulling in the same direction so uh, make sure you're working in somewhere that you're valued and somewhere that you are um, respected uh, and if you're not well um, Shrewsbury and Telford is a very nice place to work I shouldn't really say that but it's um, you know you you can go anywhere and do anything and make sure that your skills are valued the end thank you very much chris um i will have to blame you i think i'm going to have the spice girls stuck in my head for the rest of the night i was kind of half hoping you might actually sing us out of the presentation with it but um thank you that's been really insightful and i think um it's like the talk was so personal you know you mentioned about being top of the class I mean I wasn't top of the class but I was near the top end the first medic in the family and then really asking myself when my career started that what is it that I want what is success for me and um, the answer changed the answer changed as the journey has gone on and it will probably continue to change um, in the years to come but I think it's a really important question that we we should stop and ask ourselves that what is it that we really want? And the beauty of the SAS contract is that you can really personalize your career. You can tailor it to the, what you want, what you like, what you need, um, and you can pick up speed and slow down as, as time goes on. So thank you so much. And I really hope there are um, some more managers and clinical directors in our audience tonight who can um, take note from some of the things that you've spoken about. So just a reminder again, so if anybody would like to ask a, a direct question, please use the question box on the control panel um, for our panel discussion at the end. So our fourth speaker tonight is Dr. Rob Fleming. Um, Rob is a specialist anaesthetist at Sherwood Forest Hospital in Nottinghamshire. And he's an elected board member and honorary membership secretary at the Association of Anaesthetists. He is also the former SAS committee chair at the association. Um, graduating in 2005, Rob's career has developed both inside and outside of the formal training program. And he's an advocate of alternative career pathways. And through the use of social media, presentation and articles, he seeks to change the culture surrounding being a SAS doctor and give doctors the greater choice over their own career. So his talk today is how to have an alternative career with personal experiences of becoming a specialist grade anaesthetist. Thank you, Rob. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm, I've pre-recorded my talk, so I'm sure I've just had an absolutely splendid introduction, so I'm not going to repeat any of it. Um, my talk tonight is called Becoming a Specialist and um, How to Have an Alternative Career. 
Over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to touch a little bit about where the Associate Specialist came from and the history of the Associate Specialist contract. I'm not going to do too much of this because I know that Amit has already covered quite a lot of this in his talk earlier on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a specialist is and my journey to becoming one. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of advice on how to progress your career if this is what your career goal is. Um, as with every talk that I give relating to SAS careers, I have a few take home messages that I put on my first slide. And these are, there is more than one way to be a doctor. Um, alternative career pathways need parity of esteem. And the issues affecting SAS and locally employed doctors are both workforce and EDI issues. Um, as is always the case, um, I carry a small warning on the, on the early slide of my talk that each of my talks always contains pictures, diagrams, graphs and opinions. Um, I certainly do have a lot of opinions. Probably useful to start by saying that up until 2008, there was a senior SAS role to progress to. Um, the associate specialist role existed for the better part of two decades. And right up until 2008, there was the possibility and the opportunity potentially for existing SAS doctors to progress to being associate specialists and having their seniority recognised without necessarily becoming consultants. Um, after the closure of the associate specialist grade in 2008, an awful lot of organisations, an awful lot of Royal Colleges, including the Royal College of Anaesthetists and the Association of Anaesthetists, called for the restoration of a senior SAS role. We called for the reopening of the associate specialist role in order to see professional progression for the SAS workforce. Um, this formed part of this paper from the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges from December 2018 about supporting SAS doctors. And the first thing within that paper was this request to reopen the associate specialist grade. However, instead of getting the associate specialist grade back, the 2021 SAS contract reform reintroduced a new senior SAS contract, which is the specialist role. And while it has a different name and different eligibility, perhaps better defined eligibility than the old associate specialist role did, it's likely to fill a very similar niche. A specialist is a senior SAS doctor, and that's backed by both how the BMA and NHS employers describe a specialist. So you might define a specialist as a senior and experienced clinician who will work autonomously in a potentially narrower niche than a consultant. Um, that, that independence or autonomy is very important because alongside our consultant colleagues and GP colleagues, this is the first time that this has been truly reflected in the contract itself. A specialist is supposed to be an independent clinician and function independently within their clinical niche. An awful lot has been said within a lot of the national rhetoric about the importance of there being a service need for specialists and some of you may have found within your organisations that there's been some pushback against creating specialists because they say there is no service need for this um, and I would strongly disagree with that. I would say that the service need to see everyone reach their individual potential, the service need for people to progress and develop and for being a SAS doctor to be a viable alternative to a formal rotational training pathway, I think that service need absolutely exists. I think your careers matter. Um, NHS employers have certainly included some things along these lines in what they've said as well. So the introduction of the specialist role was to provide an opportunity for career progression for highly experienced specialty doctors and to help make being a SAS doctor a more positive and fulfilling career choice. Um, it was designed to extend career progression and, as I say, to make being a SAS doctor an attractive additional pathway for a career in medicine. Um, these things are obviously very much my opinion, but they are not just my opinion. They are backed by documents written by NHS employers, by the BMA and by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. And I suspect Amit has touched upon a, a few bits and pieces from here in his talk earlier on as well, but it's probably worth touching again on what is a specialist, what is the eligibility. Well, in order to become a specialist, you have to be a senior, experienced and independent colleague. Experience is defined by the eligibility criteria itself, so you cannot become a specialist with less than 12 years postgraduate medical experience. Um, and you cannot become a specialist unless you have at least six years experience in your parent specialty at the specialty doctor or equivalent level. Um, in terms of independence, that is reasonably self-explanatory. Um, and in terms of seniority, that's probably best described using the generic capabilities framework which is the document that describes the attributes of a senior SAS doctor, of a specialist. Um, some colleges have helpfully built upon the generic capabilities framework to create template person specifications and um, to describe what a specialist looks like in that specialty. Um, and the Royal College of Anaesthetists have been very kind and have done that for us very early on after the specialist role launched. So there is a Royal College of Anaesthetists template specialist person specification. Just to go into some of that in a little bit more depth, that seniority is not just being an expert clinician. 
Um, just like modern training programs are designed to create senior doctors, both in the clinical and non-clinical domains, the generic capabilities framework requires a specialist to demonstrate that they meet criteria in multiple non-clinical domains, which are listed on the slide. These include professional values and behaviours, skills and knowledge, leadership and team working, patient safety and quality improvement, safeguarding vulnerable groups, education and training of others, research and scholarship. And being a senior, being an expert independent anaesthetist won't necessarily make you a specialist. You also have to be capable of working in non-clinical areas, as we've touched upon in one of the previous webinars in this series. As I say, this is the other document worth looking out for. This is the Royal College Generic Person Specification for a Specialist Doctor. And again, this builds upon those same domains contained within the Generic Capabilities Framework to describe how you might evidence some of those things if you are a specialty doctor anaesthetist. Broadly speaking, therefore, becoming a specialist currently requires two things, and they are equally important. The first one is meeting the requirements and convincing yourself that you are in fact good enough and that you have in fact met the eligibility requirements. These include both clinical expertise, time and experience, and the progression to working independently, but they also, as I've described on the previous few slides, demonstrating that you've broadened your role into multiple non-clinical domains and that you are a well-rounded senior colleague, not just an expert clinician. And the second aspect of this, and this is absolutely every bit as important at the moment, sadly, is convincing an employer, ideally your current employer, to create you a job. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you, I think this is currently potentially the bigger barrier. Um, you will have to fight your corner. You will have to take the evidence that you meet the generic capabilities framework and that you meet the college person specification to your clinical director or to your local negotiating committee and say, I am a specialist, I'm already working as one, or I could be a specialist and I'd like to become one. Um, either way, your employer then has to figure out a way to get you on the right contract for your work. Over the next few slides, then, I'll talk to you a little bit about a representative example, me. I'll talk a little bit about my own career and how I feel I met the requirements of the specialist role. Um, your career won't necessarily look like mine. I don't think any two careers look the same as one another, but these might give you a few ideas as to how you might meet some of the things that are required to demonstrate that you are now a senior and independent expert within your specialty. My own career started fairly conventionally, so I graduated in 2005, I undertook a foundation programme, um, and then I did five years in rotational training in anaesthesia. Um, as was the norm at that time, I progressed straight from a foundation programme into what was run through training in anaesthesia. Um, and the first four years were largely without too many hurdles. Um, I passed my exams, I got my modules signed off, and I was well on my way towards CCT and becoming a consultant. Sadly, I don't think anyone's careers run as smoothly as we might like them to. Um, I had some very positive things in my life. I met my wife and I started a family um, and I had some less positive things in my life. I had some bad experiences at work um, and at the point where I was trying to do the final FRCA, I had a newborn daughter and I didn't really want to be a trainee anymore. I was profoundly burnt out um, and I decided that the most sensible thing for me would be to take a sideward step. So I made a conscious decision to resign my training number. Choosing to become a specialty doctor gave me the opportunity to pause a little bit and take, take stock and pause for breath. It gave me geographical stability, it gave me a job plan with fixed working days, it gave me SPA time and it gave me the ability to control my career, pursue my interests and, and to, to develop in ways that better suited me and my circumstances. Becoming a specialty doctor gave me control of my career and my life back. In that regard, becoming a specialty doctor for me was very much a viable career choice, as it should be for everyone. Um, the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges wrote this paper um, many, many years after I did so, but again, describing some of the reasons why someone might choose to progress and develop their career in one organisation. And a lot of those things align with the reasons why I chose to progress and develop my career within one organisation. However, I have a bee in my bonnet about fairness, and it became apparent to me after a little while of working as a SAS doctor that not every SAS doctor, and certainly not every SAS anaesthetist, were having the same experience as I was. I recognised that an awful lot of people were finding that their careers were in some way being held back by the culture and the prejudice associated with being a SAS doctor, um, and I had a problem with that. Um, so I got involved in local representation, um, I became SAS representative on my Trust Local Negotiating Committee, um, I also got involved in national representation, so I became a committee member at the SAS Committee at the Royal College of Anaesthetists, um, and I started writing articles like this one about my journey. Um, so I've had an awful lot of articles published in the, in the College Bulletin and in, the, in Anesthesia News, it's published by the Association of Anaesthetists. 
and the opportunity arose to continue my my leadership and management and representation activity in a slightly bigger role, um, I took it. So when the Association of East is advertised for a, a, a board member who was a SAS doctor, I ran for election and I was successfully elected um, in 2019. Um, so at that point, I became an elected board member of the Association. Um, and from there, I have now become um, the honorary membership secretary of the Association, where I continue to represent SAS doctors and all anaesthetists at a national level. I also got involved in some patient safety and quality improvement projects, both within my organisation and at a national level, because I was fortunate enough to be able to do so through my role at the Association of Anaesthetists. Um, I undertook a regional survey of practice in 2018 into 2019 um, and turned this into a quality improvement project, which you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, Peruse Before You Infuse is a, is a quality improvement project. Um, a quality improvement initiative designed to reduce the likelihood of making errors when using total intravenous anaesthesia um, and it's now in use in an awful lot of trusts and um, at the point where i was trying to do this i had several consultants ask me which consultant was responsible for the project um, and again i would say to you now what i said to them there is no reason why a sas doctor cannot undertake these kinds of th these kinds of initiatives by themselves i do not need a consultant's name to do my work while I was working as a specialty doctor, I also undertook some roles in education and training. I've always liked delivering education, so I undertook a generic um, instructor course and became an ALS instructor and taught very regularly on ALS courses right up until the pandemic, when I'll be honest, I, I have let this slide a little bit. Um, for a little while, I was a teaching fellow within my organisation and took some responsibility for the SSM students and the work experience students that came through my organisation. Um, I got involved in some midwifery teaching because I have an interest in obstetrics. Um, was part of multidisciplinary skills drills faculty and, and contributed to advanced um, maternal care courses um, and I also didn't ever miss an opportunity to deliver education in other areas if someone was looking for someone to talk on a topic that I was interested in I would deliver those talks um, and after I passed the FRCA as a specialty doctor I, I set up a viper practice club for the SAS doctors in my organisation to try and help others do so as well. Coming to the FRCA now Completing a full set of postgraduate exams isn't necessarily an essential criteria of becoming a specialist and there are already multiple specialists working nationally who do not have the FRCA or the European Diploma. However, it may be something that you wish to do and it may be something that makes you that provides you with a bit more evidence again that you are now a senior anaesthetist and provides you with the feeling that you have the ability to argue your case a little bit more strongly. Um, the decision will largely, largely be yours. Um, I did decide to undertake the FRCA um, and again having done so, me being me, I then wrote about my experiences of doing the FRCA for the, for the College Bulletin. So having had some roles in education, having had some roles in national representation, leadership and management, um, having had some roles in quality improvement, um, I started to wonder where my path might take me. Um, after I passed the FRCA in particular, I started thinking about how I could use these things to progress my career. Anyone who has seen me talk before is likely to have seen this slide before. Um, and I, as many people do, I found myself at this at the point where I'd done an awful lot of these, an awful lot of these things, and I was still a specialty doctor, and I wanted to feel that my career had been progressed by some of the things that I'd done. I wanted to feel that recognition and reward and progression as a result of some of the things that I'd done. Um, for a time, I contemplated trying to undertake CESR, but sadly, I was somewhat derailed by a pandemic followed by a curriculum change. Um, unfortunately, even for those of us walking our own path, we don't always have we don't have, always have control of all aspects of how our career will progress. Um, but at the point where I was realising that CESR was unlikely to be in my future, um, the specialist contract was created, and it was very apparent to me that I was already a specialist and that I already met the criteria. Sadly, as I suspect will be the case for a few doctors in the audience, the fact that I already met the criteria and the fact that I was already working in an independent fashion didn't necessarily allow me to convince my organisation to create a specialist post for me. This is happening. This is happening to doctors around the country at the moment. Um, I didn't take this very well, as you might imagine, um, and so I moved trust and this is my new trust. Um, so around two years ago now, I chose to take my career into another organisation, which I believe would be more forward thinking and might allow me to become a specialist. And within a, within a year or so of joining that organisation, I did indeed become a specialist. I applied for a specialist post, I was interviewed and I was appointed. Um, just to reiterate, becoming a specialist has given me career progression. It's given me the recognition that I am now a senior and experienced clinician within my areas of expertise. 
and it's given me recognition that I now work independently within my areas of expertise. It's given me a more generous pay scale, but more importantly for me, it's given me validation of my career pathway to date. So rounding up now towards my, my summary slide, my take home message for everyone really today is our careers don't all have to be the same, but there should be no such thing as a dead end in a career in medicine. Make your own path. And that brings me back nicely to the take home messages that I point put on my first slide. Um, there is more than one way to be a doctor. Alternative career pathways need parity of esteem and issues affecting SAS and locally employed doctors about workforce and EDI issues. Um, my advice to all of you, which I've shamelessly stolen from other people more clever than me, say yes to every opportunity, even if it's not offered to you, and then you can start. Thank you, Rob. Um, I've heard you speak uh, many a times, but I, I always take away something from your talk. So I think that the point on value is so important. I think if we want others to value us, we certainly need to be able to value ourselves first. Um, so if I can just get everybody to turn their cameras and mics on for our panel discussion. We've got the rest of our speakers here today. Thank you, and I'm just waiting on Dr. Emma Wayne. Yes, so I'd just like to introduce to you Dr. Emma Wayne, who is joining us today for the panel discussion. Um, Emma is the Honorary Treasurer and SAS Committee Chair at the Association of Anaesthetists. So thank you, Emma, for joining us tonight. Um, just going to go and stay with me a moment until I bring up some of the questions that we've got. Um, Again, please, it's uh, not too late to post any questions that you have for our panel tonight. Go on to the control panel and under the question section. So our first question is, um, why do individuals become SAS doctors rather than consultants? And what percentage of SAS anaesthetists have the UK or Irish final fellowship or an equivalent postgrad qualification? Not sure we can answer the second part of the question, but the first part, I'm sure we will all have something to say about that. I'll open it to the floor. There you go, Rob. So probably the best source of data for some of that is from the most recent Royal College Census, although it's not perfect. Um, so approximately in the last Royal College Census, there are around 1,700 SAS anaesthetists. Um, and give or take, if you count from the different columns, there are about 1,000 locally employed doctors. Um, there are slightly under 8,000 consultants and somewhere just shy of 5,000 doctors in formal training programs. So that's where we are as a specialty at the moment. Um, in terms of answering the question about um, how many of those doctors have postgraduate qualifications, um, there was a survey of SAS doctors done by Kirsten when she was chair of the um, Royal College SAS committee. Um, Kirsten and Lucy Williams, um, and if memory serves, fewer than 15% of SAS anaesthetists have a full complement of FRCA after their name. I can't speak for the European Diploma, I don't know, and I can't speak for other postgraduate qualifications in other countries because obviously a large number of SAS and locally employed doctors are international medical graduates and an awful lot of them are and would be consultants in their country of origin. So there are a lot of doctors who have um, a postgraduate qualification, it's just not a British or European one. Thank you. Does anybody want to share why they feel that individuals become SAS doctors? We'll go to Dr. Amit. Thank you, Nilofa. So, if you look at the GMC database, 65% of SAS doctors have a primary medical qualification which is outside the United Kingdom, and 35% have a primary medical qualification within the UK. So, there is a difference in aspirations and difference in uh, the way people perceive their job plans. Some are pushed into this career, whereas some take it on as a career choice. And what we'd like to see really is it becomes a career choice for everybody. Let me also say in the same breath that in every survey, 10 to 15% of the doctors that have responded have said that they're actually on the register. But yet, that means they could be a consultant, but yet they prefer to be a SAS doctor. So it is a career choice and many a time. 
I think Emma's hand was up, so I won't say any more. Yeah, on to you, Emma. Thank you. I mean, I, th I think, uh, you know, it's a great question to ask a group of SAS doctors because you're going to end up with a different answer from every single one. And in some ways, that's our strength is we all have we all have a myriad of reasons why we, we became a SAS doctor. But but actually, for all of us, it was the right decision. Um, certainly for me, it was it was actually just a lack of, of I live in Shropshire, the same as Chris. It was a lack of, lack of available childcare in a in a very rural county. And um MMC at the same time was a was a perfect storm for me. Um, I'm sure there are other people who will give similar stories, but all with per very personal nuances. Um, and as I said, I really do. I really do think it gives us such variety and and um, understanding actually as a group because we've all faced our own unique type of adversity. Yeah, and I think I'd just like to add that I. I at the time that I decided to become a specialty doctor, I felt that it was a, a bit of a, a time out for me. And it was something that I just wanted, I needed a bit of a breather from my training because I'd been in nonstop training from the get go um, after graduation. Um, I hadn't decided exactly what I wanted to do initially and had many years of training. Then I needed a time out and actually becoming a specialty doctor really made me change my views on what I wanted. And what I thought I wanted wasn't what I wanted. And um, I was just really grateful for having the opportunity to experience being a specialty doctor and personalizing my career and wholeheartedly feel that what I've achieved as a specialty doctor in the last three years, I would never have been able to achieve being a trainee anaesthetist um, on the ladder to try and become a consultant, which was my original kind of um, goal of what I wanted in my career. Um, and I've achieved far more in a lesser space of time um, being a specialty doctor. So the choice there is not one of um, an unfortunate circumstance, but it's, it's actually one which allows you more um, autonomy and liberation in your career. Is anybody else? Is it? Oh, Chris. <laughs> See if I can get this right and not be on <clears throat> not be on mute again. Um, so uh, the, for people who've who've kind of fallen off training programs, I think th there's been a the sort of the, the pathway. It's almost like um, you have to apologise for for coming off the training rotation, um, or you failed something. I saw a tweet from a, a fairly well followed account that sort of suggested that people who fail their fellowship examinations in whatever specialty and um, do so because of lack of of effort or grit on their part um, and that's just not the case um, and I think what the SAS contract reform does is it is it it, 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 it moves that to the side you know no one needs to apologize for whatever career choice they've made or how it's come about whether it's because a family member is ill or personal circumstances have meant that rotational training has become difficult there's no reason there's no glass ceiling at all um, anymore and um, uh, I think um, people should you know um, that should be a real positive that should be real, real positive news for people and um, especially international medical graduates who um, have um, uh, been hidden away and um, used as, as rotor fodder and, and should be grateful for doing so and uh, I think it, it's very clear now that we, we you know there's parity of esteem. We should recognise everybody's um, expertise the same. Absolutely agree. OK, moving on to our next question. Um, so does being autonomous need to apply to all facets of the SAS work? Or can there be a circumstance where SAS doctors are supervised by whatever method in some aspects of their work and autonomous in others? Leading on to another question, does the need for being autonomous need to be applicable to all aspects of work before ticking that autonomous box with respect to the specialist contract? So I'm going to put that to Kirsten, yeah. Um, no, the answer is no. Hopefully um, that was um, slightly clear in the talk. It's quite common for SAS doctors to have a narrow scope of practice 
um, than typically a consultant has, or I should probably say that typically a consultant has the moment they have completed their training, got their CCT and start their career because almost inevitably over time, people's scope of practice tends to narrow. And we are all familiar with um, consultant colleagues, um, for example, are not very happy to anesthetize young children or that have lost touch with certain aspects of work that they were perfectly well trained in but haven't actually practiced for a very long time. Uh, my favorite example is usually um, a colleague of mine who's a cataract surgeon who's clearly very autonomous as a cataract surgeon, an excellent cataract surgeon, but no doubt uh, would not necessarily be autonomous um, in, in, in all other areas of, of ophthalmology surgery practice. So I think you should probably aim to be autonomous in the scope of practice that is most relevant to your job, to your job plan, and that's what you're aiming for. But by no means does this have to be as wide and um, complete as it would be for someone who's achieving CCT today. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, yes, Rob. Trying to find the button that unmutes my microphone. Um, I was just going to say, as a, as a, just completely to reinforce what Kirsten's just said, really, and then take credit for it. And um, that the, as a newly appointed specialist, there are, um, I think there are eight or nine doctors within my department um, who are obstetric anaesthetists, and I'm one of them. Some are consultants, and, and several of us are specialists. Um, and I have a number of consultant colleagues who would be deeply, deeply uncomfortable setting foot on Labour Suite because it's been many years since they've done so. Um, likewise, as a specialist with an interest in a little bit of regional anaesthesia, I often go and perform blocks for some of my consultant colleagues who cannot undertake that particular block. Um, and likewise, I would call upon their expertise sometimes to come and help me out if I was anaesthetising a smaller child, um, especially a sicker smaller child. Um, and I would say that this is this is very much in keeping with how good departments should behave, is that we each have a skill set in which we are an expert. For some of us, that will be broader and for some of us, that will be narrower. But if you have a demonstrable niche within which you are an independent expert and you meet the other criteria, I would say that that makes you a specialist. Um, and I'd say that um, my, my, my better half, who is an obstetric, uh, is, is an obstetric consultant, would say that um, most people broaden if you if you work through a training program at the point where you CCT you have a very very broad range of skills and then you very very rapidly narrow into your clinical niche whereas as a specialty doctor you may develop more solely within that clinical niche but you end up roughly the same place um, and I think that's quite a nice analogy. That's true so moving, staying on the topic of autonomous practice I've got a question here that asks could a trust require the individual to demonstrate the capabilities to fulfill an on-call role, indeed the same role as the on-call consultant? I think maybe that means in, with regards to a specialist grade contract and, and working on the same on-call rota. Yeah, Rob? Actually, I was going to let Kirsten take that one first, but I will just chip in just because I've had to, I've had um, for quite a long time. I was keeping a close eye on all the specialist posts that were advertised and tweeting every single one that was completed in anaesthesia. So I have a very good handle on what's been advertised externally, at least um, over the last over the last two years. And the majority of specialist posts do not do that. So if an organisation was to say that you have to be able to work as a consultant in all aspects of your work in order to be a specialist, and um, they are wrong and they are not really in keeping with the spirit of the contract. Um, there have been a few jobs along those lines. Um, majority have been um, independent within your daytime activity with a contribution either to a lesser frequency out of hours rotor than specialty doctors in the same department um, or weekend activity only or long days and um, different places have done different things. But a role for a specialist that looks exactly the same as a consultant colleague there are there will be some specialty doctors for whom that is what they aspire to and I wouldn't wish to limit their limit their their practice if the spirit if the scope within which they are independent includes enough anesthesia to be able to cover an out of hours non-resident consultant type on call writer I wouldn't wish to say well we should not let that happen um, but I don't believe that will be the majority of specialists and that certainly isn't me as a newly appointed specialist Sorry, Kirsten, I think I missed your hand behind my control panel there. Is there something that you wanted to add? 
And yeah, no, I completely agree with what well, basically it depends on what your job says, what is the pro proposed job plan. And yes, you have to show the capabilities to match that proposed job plan, whatever that is. And I think that can be so difficult to navigate for, for a true a place on the true consultant on call rotor. And I speak from personal experience over many years, you have to show quite a lot of breadth. And we have just explained that sometimes we haven't got the depth and breadth in, in all senior SAS doctors. So that, that might not necessarily be um, the right slot, but it depends. So whatever, whatever you ask to do, yes, you do have to show that capability. Amit, you, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's a tricky one, this, because the trust can't ask you to be a consultant at the wage of a specialist or a specialty doctor. I think that is uh, extending it a bit further than they should be. Having said that, I'll go back to what Kristen said right in the beginning, which is your team is what matters. Even a consultant sometimes will turn around and say, look at orthopedics, for example, you take on somebody who's a hand surgeon, they've qualified so much more, but when they're doing the on-call, if they have a complicated hip, they'll call somebody else in. And that, and that support, if the team offers you that support, by all means, take it. Autonomous work needs to be recognized in the daytime as well as the evening. SAS stands for specialist, associate specialist, and specialty doctor. It doesn't stand for safe after six, because do not, certainly do not abuse the, 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 the grade. I'll just add one more point. The GMC says you, you should work within your competency, and, and that's something to remember because um, the MDU and the MDTDUS, when we approached them, they said they would indemnify you if you worked within your competency as an autonomous practitioner. So that, that is vital. But the team metrics is very, very important. Thank you. Great. Chris, is there anything that you want to add from the um, aspect of a clinical director? And is that a requirement that you ask for when you're looking for autonomous and somebody who, who had to prove them to work on the consultant on call rotor um no i, I think it there's 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 no one size fits all um solution um to this it, it, it very much depends on on an individual's um strengths and weaknesses and what you know f from their perspective um as much as anything else um and it's you know it's a team sport um there's there's no um you don't have to start at um at a million miles an hour you know it's it, you know describing that progression and where you want to be if somebody wants to end up on on the consultant rotor or they're they're very they're very determined to achieve um caesar um, it's about you know creating the opportunities for somebody to to get there and um uh, whatever support they need along the way um you know the as a clinical director things are much less hard and fast um, and black and white than when i started in the role um there's 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 aspects of gray and everything um you know making sure people feel well supported in in whatever they're doing is the um is the most important thing i think just but can a specialist to... join the consultant rotor 100 percent yeah there yeah. are um, many many specialist doctors out there who function um uh, or in the same way that that um that consultants do in every aspect of their practice i've got a question that's relating to this and i think uh, you you'd be suitable to answer this and uh, obviously open to the panel as well um there are not many specialist doctors in scotland at the moment for obvious reasons I've been told to look forward to the next X number of years to tick the desirable column of person's specifications. Quite an unsatisfactory response. How do I reapproach this with my clinical director? Go ahead, Rob. 
Well, I would say that this is, we've probably had a handful of questions along similar lines, I suspect. I can't see what you can see, Milipa, but I would imagine that there are a cluster of people watching tonight who are wondering how they deal with a clinical director that seems unenthusiastic about the idea of creating specialists. Um, and I would say to them, you know, and I'd say the same thing to their clinical directors, um, this is coming to your department one way or another. Um, you, so the specialist role is coming to your department either as the way that you recognise your existing senior colleagues um, and that you turn their roles into supportive progressive careers um, or it's coming to your department as the way that you lose your most motivated doctors to other organizations because certainly in England the Scottish contract reform is much newer than the English contract reform Scotland only did their contract reform in October of last year so it's less than a year old and we are two and a half years down the line in England now um, I know a lot of doctors uh, myself included uh, who have moved to become specialists and because the most motivated people will take their will take their talents out of your organization and um, so I, I would say it can be a positive thing and it can be a very important aspect of belonging within your organisation, but you will lose people if you aren't prepared to think about doing this for them. Thank you. And Chris? Um, send them my way. Um, it, it, it was, it's an absolute no-brainer. Um, you know, when, we, when uh, we were looking at how we transition people from the SAS contract and people who it turned out were on locally employed don doctor contract onto the specialist contract is like right get let, uh, let's make it happen like right now get the adverts out um, and get you know get people um, in the appropriately recognized posts it's an absolute no-brainer for any trust out there if you're having difficulty and you're having tr trouble negotiating these things because you will um, there, there will be barriers, um, uh, especially in older style departments, which historically haven't had difficulties recruiting. Uh, they will do um, fairly soon if they're not already. And um, you need to find some allies. Um, so allies in, in other specialties around the trust that may have done the same thing. You need to get an SAS representative on the LNC if there isn't one already. Um, and uh, you need to be, you know, be, be, be having those conversations um, in, in bigger areas, not just within the silo of your department. Um, other trusts around the area, um, trusts in England um, that, that are doing it, um, you know, my contact details are easily available. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about, um, about how they, 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 they get what they deserve. That's great. Thank you very much. Now, unfortunately, I am conscious of the time and I'm going to have to wrap it up there. There are a few more questions, but we've simply run out of time. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to all the speakers and the audience for attending today. An absolute special thank you to Mr. Amit Kocher, who has logged in from India and it's past 1 a.m. there. So <laughs> I'm very conscious of the time there. Um, thank you so much. An email with instructions to access the recording will be sent out tomorrow. Um, please, will you kindly complete the delicate evaluation form, which is really helpful for us at the association um, for future events. And for any further online education and upcoming events, please log on to the association website. Thank you once again for everybody tuning in tonight and have a good night.